So yeah, so this is joint work with Sumega Garg uh, and Mark Zandri. Um, so the main question that uh, we're going to focus on in this talk is uh, what sorts of uh, security notions uh, can we expect for message authentication uh, in a world with uh, quantum <coughs> adversaries? So, uh, you know, we know that, uh, you know, once quantum computers come online, um, we, we expect to see adversaries with uh, enhanced computational capabilities, uh, such as, um, you know, the ability to factor. Um, but in addition to that, um, these quantum adversaries will be able to um, access uh, and interact with quantum, uh, with cryptographic protocols in a quantum manner, something fundamentally different. Um, and, uh, you know, we would like to understand what does it even mean to be secure uh, in such a setting. So uh, in this work, uh, we're going to uh, explore, um, you know, quote unquote, best possible uh, notions of security, or at least attempt to get uh, best possible notions of security. Um, and we're going to give constructions uh, realizing these security definitions. Um, and for this talk, we're going to focus on um, a, a very basic setting. Um, so we're going to focus on the setting of information theoretic security. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about private key uh, protocols in, in, uh, with where the parties communicate only once between each other. Okay. And, and there's two parts. Uh, one is we're going to focus on protocols that um, authenticate classical messages. Um, and then in the second part, we're going to talk about full-fledged uh, authentication of quantum data. Okay, so authenticating classical messages. Um, let me focus on message authentication codes, or MACs. Okay, so these are a, a basic crypto primitive uh, that ensure uh, message authenticity and integrity. And so let me uh, explain this by way of example. Um, so let's say there's a bank, you know, your favorite bank, and you want to uh, transmit the following message M to it. You know, withdraw $100 from my bank account. Okay, and you'd like to do this in some uh, secure and uh, authenticated way. So let's say you use your uh, bank card, um, and let's imagine that the bank card shares a random key between um, uh, itself and the bank. So, and the random key H, uh, you can think of as being a random hash function. Okay, so uh, when you send this message over, uh, your bank card will append a hash, you know, H of M of the message you wanna send to the bank. And when the bank sees this, it can check that the, uh, the tag, this H of M uh, uh, piece, uh, is indeed the hash of the message it received, um, and it will accept and then withdraw $100 from your bank account. Okay, but what if there's an active adversary uh, who's uh, trying to corrupt the communication from uh, you know, yourself uh, to the bank, and it instead wants to create an authentication of some other message and prime uh, that, you know, for example, could say transfer $1,000 to Charlie, if, you know, say the attacker's name is Charlie. Um, and uh, it tries to uh, cook up uh, a bogus authentication tag, T prime, uh, to convince the bank to do this. Uh, well, the security guarantee of, uh, of a one-time Mac is that, um, you know, even if the attacker gets to choose this original message M, uh, and it sees, uh, you know, the message tag pair M, uh, comma, H of M, uh, with high probability it should not be able to produce uh, a forgery, in, uh, a, you know, a different message tag pair. Um, okay, so uh, achieving this uh, security definition is not hard in the classical setting. Um, if H is a pairwise independent hash function, um, then uh, this gives rise to a uh, information theoretically secure uh, one-time MAC. This is also known as the Wegman-Carter one-time MAC. Okay, and uh, this is secure against uh, computationally unbounded uh, adversaries, or classical adversaries, all right? Um, and uh, this definition can be uh, easily generalized to the many time setting. Um, so let's say, uh, you know, this smart card is used to authenticate uh, multiple messages, say messages M1 up to MQ, um, and uh, the attacker gets to see the, um, the th authentications of all of them, um, it still should not be able to produce uh, a forgery um, you know, so long as the number of queries to the MAC uh, Q is, um, say, polynomial in some security parameter. All right. So the question we're interested in is, well, what if the adversary has a quantum computer? Okay. Um, 
if the interaction uh, between all the parties is classical, then the Wegman-Carter Mac, for example, still remains secure. And this is because we have information theoretic security um, uh, of this Mac, right? So uh, if the interaction is still classical, then the only difference uh, potentially is that the adversary has more computational power, um, but as I just explained, this uh, doesn't affect the security. Um, but on the other hand, if the interaction is quantum, uh, then you know, we have to ask ourselves, well, what, is it, what does it mean to be secure? Okay, so to explain what uh, quantum interaction uh, is like, uh, I'm going to uh, explain uh, the basics of quantum information to you guys in one slide. Um, and uh, it's not too hard. So the first thing is, uh, you know, imagine that you have some system uh, that can uh, be in um, D possible classical states. So for example, you have a bit, it can be uh, either on or off, these are two states. Um, Quantum mechanics says that this system, uh, the classical states can be uh, mathematically described by um, elementary basis vectors. So say state one uh, is represented by uh, the vector that's one in the first coordinate and zero everywhere else. Okay, uh, and you know, similarly for the uh, other classical states. Uh, but more generally, um, this system can also be uh, a, a you know, in a quantum state. And this is described uh, most generally by a complex unit vector uh, in C to the D, okay? And uh, quantum states are, uh, you know, represented by these, uh, this funny bracket notation, but really all this is is just some linear combination of the D basis states, and we have the constraint that all these coefficients, um, alpha sub i, uh, you know, they're complex numbers, they can be, you know, positive, negative, or imaginary, um, they just have to uh, square and sum to one. Okay, that's, uh, if you have something like this, this is a, a quantum state. And the way to think about this is that uh, if you have a system uh, that's described by this state, um, you can think of it as, you know, somehow simultaneously being um, these uh, classical states all at the same time, um, but with these complex weights uh, somehow um, in the background. Okay. And, uh, you know, how do states change over time? Uh, well, they change over time via linear transformations that preserve L2 norm, also known as unitary matrices. So if you have some quantum state of the system psi and you apply unitary matrix to it, you get another complex unit vector psi prime, um, and that's just an, another quantum state. Okay, the last thing is something called measurement. So this is another thing that can uh, happen to a uh, quantum state. Um, if you have a quantum state psi and you measure it, um, what you get is a classical state, um, uh, I, whoops, with uh, probability alpha I squared. Okay, and these are probabilities because they, they sum to one. Um, and, uh, and the important thing to know about measurement is that once you measure, uh, it collapses and you get a classical state out and all the information about the other alpha I's just disappear. Okay, so uh, in this sense, quantum states are, are fat, fragile. So here's an example of a quantum state. Um, you've probably heard of Schrodinger's cat. Um, it can either be alive or dead. Um, and, but a possible quantum state of this cat is uh, the um, superposition of being dead and alive where the, uh, the coefficients, these alpha i's are one over square root two and you know, it has a coefficient of minus one over square root two of being alive, you know, whatever that means. Okay, so now that you know uh, as much quantum information as I do, uh, we can now think about, uh, you know, what can, you know, different attack methods uh, that the attacker can perform. So what if the attacker queries your bank card uh, with a superposition of messages? So this is, uh, we call this a quantum chosen message attack. Uh, and what the adversary will do is just prepare some uh, superposition of uh, classical messages and feed it into uh, the smart card. And the smart card uh, will then authenticate it uh, in superposition. So you can imagine that now this quantum state is just, uh, you know, possibly an exponential number of messages all authenticated simultaneously. And uh, then the question is, well, what can the adversary do with this quantum state? Uh, maybe it could perform some um, complicated quantum computation on the state uh, to say extract the secret key, this hash function H. 
Okay? Um, you know, can this uh, adversary produce a, a forgery um, just from this one quantum superposition query? So this question has been um, s studied before. Uh, so in 2013, uh, Bonet and Zandri uh, gave a security definition for this model where the attacker can make superposition queries. So we say that a Mac is uh, Q time BZ secure if it can make Q superposition queries to this Mac. Yet, uh, no matter what, it, you know, what quantum computation it does uh, afterwards, it can't produce uh, Q plus one valid uh, message tag pairs with non-negligible probability. Okay. So this is a pretty natural definition of security for um, message authentication codes. Uh, it kind of lines up with um, you know, the, the classical security definition. Uh, and uh, you know, one theorem that they proved is um, if you have, uh, if H is a 3Q plus one uh, you know, wise independent uh, hash family, this yields a Q time uh, BZ secure MAC, uh, provided we have some, you know, the output range is, uh, of the hash family is large enough. Okay. So, so that was a feasibility result, um, and uh, as uh, Aaron mentioned uh, in, in the first talk, um, there are some negative results uh, showing that uh, there are some standard uh, message authentication codes like CBC MAC, PMAC, and so on that, are, uh, that actually fail to be uh, quantum secure. That is, there are quantum superposition attacks that are able to um, extract the secret key. Okay. So uh, uh, in our work, what we ask is, you know, so that's a very nice definition, but can we demand uh, an even stronger guarantee than, uh, than the Bonet-Zandri um, security definition. So uh, their definition doesn't rule out the following situation. So let's imagine that um, the attacker prepares a superposition over classical messages where each of these messages M uh, in this uh, set, you know, script M, are strings that are prefixed with, say, um, the string Alice. So uh, this superposition gets submitted to uh, the smart card, and it, it signs all of them, and it returns it to the, uh, um, the adversary. And what the, you know, the Bonet-Zandri definition says is that now this attacker can't produce, you know, since the, it only made one quantum query, it can't produce two uh, message, you know, valid message tag pairs. But it doesn't rule out producing one message tag pair, m prime, h of m prime, uh, where m prime now is a string that starts with Charlie instead of Alice. Okay. So technically, this isn't. Uh, oh, this is allowed by the BZ security definition, um, but uh, it somehow seems, um, you know, the, the, somehow this seems like there's a break in security. Like, how was uh, this attacker able to produce a, a valid forgery? Um, uh, of a message that wasn't even in the original superposition, right? Okay. So uh, we give a uh, security definition that uh, rules such behavior out, uh, at least in the one-time setting. So uh, our security definition uh, uh, says the following. So let's consider uh, the, the real experiment. So, um, you know, in this experiment, the attacker will um, produce an arbitrary uh, superposition of messages. Uh, authenticate it um, and you know perform some attack and sends this attack over to the bank. Okay, this is just what happens in the real protocol. Um, and we would like to compare this with the uh, ideal experiment in which uh, the adversary, when it first you know before it does anything, it's going to measure the superposition that it receives from uh, the smart card. Okay, and. Uh, and I put this powdered wig uh, on this uh, adversary to indicate that it's acting classically. Okay. So when it measures, uh, what it obtains uh, is, uh, you know, remember that I told you when you measure a quantum state, you're going to get a classical outcome with some probability, and then the uh, superposition collapses. Uh, and it will get uh, m comma h of m with some probability alpha m squared. And then based on this classical outcome, it's going to do some processing, it's going to send some state, depending on this m, h of m, to the bank. Okay, so in, in essence, this is uh, just a classical attack. Um, and uh, our security definition says, 
uh, your Mac uh, is epsilon reducible to classical adversaries um, if both these views uh, are epsilon indistinguishable uh, in the accepting case. Okay, uh, that's what we, you know, that's the guarantee that we make. Um, and an included uh, in these views um, is this, we have the state of the secret key. Um, it includes the message sent to the receiver. Uh, and also, uh, we also characterize what happens um, to the state of the attacker's private memory. So this is a pretty all-encompassing um, security definition. Okay. Um, all right, so, so that's the secure definition. Now, uh, can we actually achieve it? It turns out that we can. Um, if H uh, is a three-wise independent uh, hash family mapping n bits to t bits, um, then the security of H uh, actually um, redu epsilon reduces to classical uh, adversaries for um, uh, ep exponentially small epsilon. Okay, so, uh, so this shows you that, uh, you know, sort of a, um, you know, the most straightforward one-time Mac that you would use um, in the classical setting uh, is still secure in the quantum setting because it just forces the adversary, even if it has uh, a quantum computer, to act classically. Um, and we already know of security guarantees in that case. Um, okay, so, right, so a corollary is that, you know, the, our, the Wegman-Carter Mac uh, with three universal hashing uh, resists forgeries uh, even against um, superposition queries, and this uh, recovers the, uh, the BZ um, security notion for one-time Macs. Um, and sort of more informally, um, you know, you can ask, well, what information can the adversary learn about the key? Um, it, this just reduces to a question of, well, what can a classical adversary um, learn about the key? Okay, and, uh, um, right, not very much. Okay, um, so, so let me point out some features of our security definition. Um, in some sense, it is the best possible security definition for one-time max in the quantum setting. Why is that? Well, um, you know, the adversary can always uh, measure the, the superposition and just pass on, you know, once it measures, it passes on the, the classical outcome it gets, and this will never be detected by the receiver, right? The receiver, all it does is just, you know, it gets a message tag pair and just checks that they're consistent. Um, and if you, you know, measure the superposition and pass on a valid message uh, tag pair, uh, the, you know, the receiver's always going to uh, accept. Um, so you can never rule such a, 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 an attack out. And what we're saying is this is the only type of uh, operation that the uh, adversary can do. So, you know, it, it gets this classical outcome and then just does some processing on its, um, uh, you know, on the message it receives and its own private space. And, you know, we can never uh, rule such a thing out. Okay, so a another feature of our security definition is that it uh, considers the state of the key uh, in the view. So it, it considers the uh, correlations between um, all the parties, you know, the messages, um, uh, the adversary with the key. And, and so, in fact, our security definition holds with high probability um, uh, over the choice of key. All right, so that's that for um, authenticating classical messages. Let me now turn to the uh, quantum setting uh, where we want to um, authenticate, you know, full-fledged quantum data. So, so now, um, all parties possess quantum computers. You know, this is in some, um, uh, you know, this is in the future. And uh, let's say Alice and Bob share a secret key. Um, and uh, Alice has some quantum state that she wants to send to Bob. Okay. Uh, and uh, Bob wants to uh, recover the state and detect if any tampering has happened uh, to this quantum state that uh, Alice wanted to send. So uh, in this protocol, Alice will you know, try to encode her quantum state somehow, so E of psi. She sends it across the wire, and now the adversary will just perform some arbitrary quantum attack, um, you know, A of, uh, on this encoding, and Bob ha now has to uh, decide whether to accept or reject, and hopefully if it accepts, it produces a quantum state psi prime that's close to uh, the original state psi. So what kind of security guarantees can we hope for in this setting? Well, uh, we, we saw in the previous talk that uh, actually uh, we can hope for quite a lot. Um, 
and, and so, so he, here's what we can hope for. So you know, here's the real experiment. Um, you know, they, they run this, uh, some protocol. Um, and uh, we have a, a secure uh, protocol if this view is indistinguishable from the following ideal experiment where Alice just sends her encoding of her message straight through and the adversary doesn't even look at it and the adversary just you know, performs some quantum operation on his own private memory, right? He doesn't even interact with the system. Okay. Um, this is the ideal experiment and it turns out, uh, right, so our, our security definition is um, uh, that these two views are indistinguishable in the accepting case. And again, included in the view uh, is you know, the message sent to the receiver, the state of the attacker's private memory, and also the state of the secret key. Okay, and uh, this definition extends uh, previously, uh, you know, uh, previous definitions, um, you know, the main feature is that now the key is also included as part of the view. Before, the key was just, you know, these, this indistinguishability statement uh, held on average uh, over the key. Okay, so first let me uh, describe what are some consequences uh, of this security definition. So uh, first, this says that if you have a secure quantum authentication protocol, you've effectively made uh, the attacker oblivious to the, you know, the communication. So in, in the accept case, uh, the adversary effectively doesn't even look at the message. And this is rather strong. I mean, in, in the classical world, you can never pre you know, prevent the attacker from examining the messages that are sent across the wire. But one feature of quantum mechanics is that uh, you know, if you try to measure a quantum state, it necessarily disturbs it. And it's this disturbance that hopefully will be uh, detected by the receiver. Um, so, you know, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, uh, this definition actually allows for key recycling. So uh, if you look at this ideal experiment, uh, the message just goes across to Bob and the adversary doesn't even look at the message. So what that means is that the adversary d can't be correlated with the key because uh, it was independent um, to begin with uh, and it's going to be independent uh, afterwards. So that means in the accept case, you can safely reuse um, the secret key um, for some other protocol um, in full. And, uh, and this is something that, again, in the classical world is not possible without computational assumptions. Um, and I also want to mention that uh, uh, previous works were also able to argue that you can reuse the key in, in some, you know, or partially reuse the key. Um, but uh, here, our security definition says that, in fact, you can use um, all of it. All right, so, uh, so let me mention some constructions that satisfy this uh, security definition. Um, the previous talk described the, uh, this unitary design scheme, um, and they, they showed, in fact, that uh, if you use something called unitary two designs, which is like the quantum analog of uh, a pairwise independent hash function, in some sense, um, this actually gives rise to uh, you know, a quantum secure authentication scheme. Uh, I won't talk about this here. I want to talk about another protocol we give uh, which we call auth QFT auth. And um, this is a secure authentication scheme that actually uses uh, the Wegman Carter Mac um, as its building block. Okay? And you know, there's one caveat that it, it satisfies a slightly weaker definition of security, which I'll describe in a second. Um, so, so this is how it works. So let's say you have a classical Mac. You know, just think of the Wegman Carter Mac. You know, H is like a three-wise independent hash function. Um, and so this is how the, the encoding is going to work. So Alice has some quantum state psi. It's going to just treat psi as, uh, as if it were a classical message. So it applies the Wegman Carter Mac, okay? And then uh, on the resulting state, it's going to apply the quantum Fourier transform uh, on this state. And then after that, it's going to apply um, another invocation of the Wegman Carter Mac using uh, a fresh key, H prime. Right, very simple. The coding is just simply the reverse process. The, the receiver is just going to check that uh, you know, the outer authentication tags were consistent with the message. 
Um, it then performs the inverse quantum Fourier transform and then checks that the inner authentication uh, checks out. Okay. It turns out that this simple uh, authentication scheme is secure if we don't, uh, as long as we don't consider the second key H prime. Okay. But uh, aside from this caveat, uh, we have exactly the same guarantee. With high probability, if there's any tampering on this state, um, the receiver will be able to, to detect it. Okay. Um, all right, so it looks like I'm out of time. Uh, so, uh, so let me summarize. Uh, we give some new security notions for measures authentication in the quantum world, um, you know, both for classical authentication and quantum authentication. Uh, we gave some constructions. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs>